That's all right. You just have to keep reminding me. Um, okay. So, so I did cover this. I did write this huge long paragraph on my little soapbox about, about the discipline of psychology. Um, and again, I'm not against it in every sense. I, I, there's a woman at our school that I go to periodically to clean up my psyche, just like Serena's goes to Seneca, or his friend. Um, but it, I think it goes too far and you can decide for yourself. That's mainly, I want, I want to find out how the students react to all this material based on their own experience. Um, okay, so we had all this stuff. I think that's clear. Um, are there any questions about the syllabus? Okay, all right. So then the next thing was Aristotle's virtues. And you've already reacted to it to some degree. And I will just, what I'll do is I'll give some more examples than I did last time. Last time, because it was an hour and 40 minutes before I finally figured it out. Um, I didn't give as many examples as I usually do. And the other thing I want you to be aware of is it, how biased my examples are. If my examples are Western, if they're colonial, um, you can give me a heads up on that. But it is, I'm doing it just because I want to be able to check, you know, the bias in my uh, culture, right? I'm in this bubble of culture and I keep trying to get out of it, but um, still, I use the examples that I know. And then also that can help you understand how your examples come from your culture, even though you might be trying to be more universal. And it, that's another reason it's so nice. The students at AUW come from so many different countries. So hopefully in the breakout rooms, you'll realize that, oh, the example that she gave for generosity is really different from me because in their country they do this, in my country they do that. So, and you can comment on that to each other too. You don't have to just keep it to yourself. Um, all right, so that's what I would like to do. I gave a number of examples on temperance and courage, right? Fear and generosity in general, um, you can, I'm sure that each country that you come from probably has a socialization of people for generosity that's different. I, I, what I, my impression is that the people, excuse me, the people I know who come from developing countries really give gifts a lot and they give substantial gifts. I was just at a dinner at my old school and my friends from Sri Lanka, especially the woman from Sri Lanka, she's given me so many amazing gifts over the years that it's, wow, like, and I, I mean, I always think, how can you afford that? You know? <laughs> and I think that's because in my country, we're always doing this sort of cost benefit analysis because Americans are such a, America is such a business oriented culture and it, it has always amazed me that in, in Indonesia, I got a lot of gifts that were really, people had to shell out. They didn't have a lot of money and they, you know, spent serious money um, giving me a gift. And so um, that's very humbling. And it's, it's a, I think it's a cultural difference. Um, magnanimity, um, we went through that with all the organizations that actually have made AUW possible. Um, then another 
another issue is the the degree of anger and the nature of anger and what makes people angry is varies a lot in different cultures and so you can talk about um, examples of anger if some of you brought those into your group or even if you didn't you could go around the circle and talk about um, how anger is expressed in your country and you can compare and contrast different countries. Now, okay, there's a stereotype about people from Minnesota, which is related to their background in Scandinavia. So Scandinavians and have a reputation for being, you know, um, laid back or not get not really emotional, right? And so what that turns into is sometimes passive aggressive. People, you know, don't tell you they're mad at, they're mad at you, but they are. <laughs> and so my daughter-in-law is from Mexico and she absolutely cannot believe how I can be at the same party with my ex-husband. So, so my ex-husband and I come to this, a lot of family parties. We see each other a lot. And my Mexican daughter-in-law just can't believe that because she said, oh, nobody in Mexico would do that. They don't want to see their ex-spouse, you know, they're still mad, blah, blah. So she expresses emotion a lot more than my family does. And so my son and his wife, everybody knows, you know, they're sort of opposites. But that's related not just to disposition, it's related to culture and what's considered acceptable. So, um, but still every society has some idea of an extreme because extreme anger is um, psychologically unhealthy and socially it breaks down culture. Um, it's a detriment to culture. Um, the other thing about Scandinavians or people who don't get angry enough is that they hold a grudge <laughs> and they might take revenge later on. Like they'll act like they don't care, but just then all of a sudden whammo. So it's much better to express your anger at the time. And then that sort of releases it. So you don't hold a grudge. But again, each culture is a little different on that. Rational ambition, how does that play out in your country? Um, in my country, again, it's way too biased for ambition being based on how, making money, right? Success means having money. And that's unhealthy. The Greeks would say that that is the political um, evil. That's the worst character trait for developing a healthy culture. Um, so, uh, I don't know if, if this happens to you in when you're telling your, your teachers, no, I mean, your friends or your family, the courses that you're taking. But I know at Lyon, when my students say they tell their parents, well, I took a philosophy course or I took one in addition to the one required. Well, you know what their parents said, well, you're not gonna make any money on that. <laughs> Why are you doing that? Uh, so I don't know if you run into that. Um, so my parents grew up in the depression the, and they were poor. My dad was really poor. But then America became an economic superpower in his lifetime. And so when he, when he had a daughter who decided to go into philosophy, he thought that was great because, ah, that was what he was not able to do. The trouble is he kept telling me, it's only money, don't worry. And so I had three children and I'd spent all these years studying philosophy and I had no job. And so I thought, why did my dad keep telling me it didn't matter at all, right? So he sort of went to the other extreme that money doesn't matter at all. Um, so it can matter too much and it can matter too little, but mostly it should be the nature of what you're doing that matters. 
And if you are get good at something you really care about, if you care about it, you'll do it well. If you do it well, it's very likely you have reasons to think you'll get promoted and you will be successful and you will have a good salary. So that's the idea behind what the Greeks are about. Um, pride is, and what is it on an honor day? What is it that people in your culture honor in another person, right? What is considered particularly honor, honorable? Um, and that there's similarities and differences in that. Humor, what about humor? What is it that makes people in your country laugh? Uh, or are people in your country sort of known for being having a vulgar sense of humor? The two extremes are being vulgar or being just boring. <laughs> um, so you could talk about that a little bit. Um, I think there's a lot of vulgarity in the comedians in the US, but there are also some of them like Jon Stewart and um, Stephen Colbert, who actually the humor is educational. It helps people think more critically about what's going on in the world. Um, they can take a step back and go, yeah, I didn't think about that. So uh, humor can be a great way to educate people it's just that it, it can also be a way to um, feed people's resentments or humiliate people. So you have to be careful and you have to analyze it and think about it. Then friendships are really important. I'm gonna talk about friendships in the essay by Seneca. So you could talk about um, how friendships help you maintain your um, strength of mind, or how relationships that break down really do cause you um, disruption, right? They cause you anxiety and Serenus's problem, right? Uh, vacillation. It, when you lose a friend, you might also engage in a lot of self-doubt and that it's hard, it's hard. Um, so you can talk about that for a while. Sociability, do people get angry at each other about petty things, trivial things, or do a lot of people just keep things in perspective? Um, and the, again, it can be you personally or your family or it can be in general in the culture. Truthfulness, do people try to be honest about themselves? Do they try to be intellectually honest about what they know or don't know? Um, I know where I've been teaching, the particular kind of Christianity, fundamentalist Christianity, I think it's intellectually dishonest because when people can't make sense of something, they say, oh, it's God's will. And that's, that's just a lie, right? <laughs> you don't know that. And um, I think whether you believe in God or evolution or whatever, we have minds and we can learn how to take care of ourselves and each other. We can learn how to flourish and we're supposed to do that. And I really do not like people who think that God wants us not to use our minds. And then when things happen, we just say it's God's will. So <laughs> I'm a philosopher, right? This just doesn't compute for me. Or, I mean, you know that religions have been used to justify sexism, that it's God's will for women to be at home and not get go to college. Like, how do you know that, right? It's hides, it's not intellectually honest. If you observe that women are capable, then you should draw the conclusion that God wants women to be able to exercise their abilities. Who are you to say they're not, right? Seems really arrogant to me. Uh, the political virtues, this is uh, really important. What does it mean to be a good citizen in your country? And I know like in Afghanistan and other countries where the political situation has just collapsed, it's really difficult 
for citizens to participate in public life and in political life. And I know that the students I had last spring, many of them would have made wonderful political leaders, but of course they didn't have access. They were the wrong ethnicity or uh, they're women or something. So that's really unfortunate. It's a huge waste of potential, of natural capabilities. The country prevents people from developing their capabilities, which is really sad, or their virtues. So what is it about um, the economic system in your country? Does it really reward greed? Or do people in business know that they need to give back through taxes or nonprofits or other ways to lift everybody up? Um, or do the legislators, are they skilled at knowing how to make laws that will promote a middle class? Or are they totally corrupted, <laughs> right? Are they just the puppets of the rich? Or are they just stupid? They, or are they out of touch with people they don't really know? how to create incentives and disincentives, um, distributing wealth. Um, are the people in your country in general good at this? Uh, allocating resources like education and healthcare, or do they just structure the society to help their friends and harm their enemies? What about punishments for, the, how is the criminal justice system? Um, are there certain judges that have reputations for being particularly good at being a good judge or particularly bad? Um, and then a jury, uh, were there famous jury trials that turned out to make good judgments or bad judgments? I don't know if you know about the George Floyd case where the um, police officer Derek Chauvin was, was actually accused of all three counts against him, second degree murder, third degree murder. That took place right where I raised my children. My daughters went to high school two blocks from where the, the, violent, the violence was. My son lived two thirds of a mile from where he was killed. So that's my old neighborhood. And I am proud of the fact that they did consider him guilty and he's got a lot of prison time to look at. But I'm also really disappointed that this is like the 18th complaint against him. He had already put his knee on other people's necks. He just hadn't quite killed them yet. And so it, that's not something to be proud of. So right now our country is going through a process of re-examining the racism in the, in the criminal justice system. But the trouble is there are a lot of people who are gonna resist change. And I think people have said this before and it just keeps going back to the old racist situation. So we'll hope for the best here. Um, so practical wisdom is situations where Okay, we have to make a decision. And this happens all day in your life. You do it without even realizing you're doing it. It's just life. But you say, okay, this is my goal. I, I want to do well at AUW or whatever it is. And then what do I need to do? What are my options? Uh, what classes, how do I do blah, blah, everything you do is relative to the goal. And then you always, in any situation, uh, what am I gonna do after class? Am I gonna stay online and do some more work? I'm gonna go to bed. <laughs> um, just that kind of stuff. So what options are actually attainable and what are not? Um, do you think your culture emphasizes in, in America people feed, the corporate world will feed people fantasies. They want people to believe that if they work hard, they'll get rich. And if they don't get rich, it's their fault. And that is completely false. But um, 
that people will deliberate on the basis of that. They will assume that that is an option when it really isn't. And then they'll get frustrated when they can't get rich and then they'll try to find someone to blame. And that's very dysfunctional society, right? The art of deliberation has been corrupted by greed. Um, or in our case, military, right? We use military to go out there and you know, change, make Afghanistan a democracy or make Iraq, it's just totally stupid. It's not an option. But then when it doesn't work, we'll blame the Iraqis. You see, they can't handle it. <laughs> it's very stupid. But um, those things happen all the time. And you can try to think of examples like that. Then once you get what actually the options are, which one is best and why, and then you explain to other people uh, why you've come to that conclusion, you can actually persuade them to go along with this and to do what they need to do to achieve this goal through that means. And then we have the art of production and we have the intellectual virtues. So you could also talk about um, in your countries, I had a student from Vietnam or actually two of them last semester. And they, excuse me, they said that the high schools are the best high schools and the best and brightest students are constantly being hammered at to do math and science, to do STEM and to get really good at a STEM discipline and to get a STEM career because that's what's going to make their society great, right? Or successful. And we, my students are sort of um, questioning that, right? One of them really wants to dedicate her life to liberal arts education because she thinks that's what her country needs. Um, and AUW actually set up for the graduates to focus on public health. We have programs that are actually designed for on the one hand, science, medicine, STEM things, but not for the sake of money so much or status, but for the sake of women helping women, lifting up women. Um, so you can talk about that if you like. Is your country sort of selling out to STEM or does it have a pretty balanced view? I know that the students from Sri Lanka were telling me about how much the arts play a role in their cultural life that I think the president or somebody recites poetry or something. It sounded really wonderful. Um, and when we were talking about the place of art in culture, they wrote some really amazing things. So um, you, can, you can think about, does my country balance? the humanities or the arts with the sciences or are just we whole hog stem and what's good and what's bad about that. So Aristotle's emphasis is that you really need to cultivate all of these capabilities and they need to get integrated. And the intellectual virtues need to be guided by moral character and practical wisdom, the art of deliberation. Because if somebody's smart, but they're greedy or they're power hungry, they can really do a lot of damage. So again, you could give examples from your country if you want to. Um, all right, so that I am gonna break you into groups now. And um, when, okay, you would have a leader from your group and when you think your group has really talked itself out, you've said everything you can that anybody wants to say, then the leader should come to me, come back to the main group. And I think I, I will turn off the recording so that these recordings don't get to be so long. Um, I, you know, my preference would be that you really keep having so much to say that you take 20 or 30 minutes, you know? But if you don't, if you just run out of juice after 10 or 15 minutes, that's fine. Just be honest. I definitely don't want you to be sitting 
and staring at each other or whatever. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I want you to stay intellectually active and alive during the whole three hours if you can. That's the goal. And, and I know I can trust you that you're not going to just sit there but not tell me because you're being lazy. That's not true. AUW students aren't like that. Um, so let me do the breakout rooms and um, open all rooms. Let's see. Um, Professor, are we going to just discuss Aristotle's views and I mean, virtues and vices? Or okay, so what, you're, what I asked you to do for today was come up with a couple ideas based on the lecture last time. And so then this time, I want you to just go through the list. You start out with the things that you are interested in, and then the leader, the person who's de designated the leader, would just keep going through that list and picking out things that struck you while I was talking about it, right? that you want to react to? Um, does that answer your question? Yes, Professor. I hope that you can remember those virtues or that you can have access to the document. Um, the leader could go onto the, onto the classroom if they want to be reminded of what the list consists of, but Okay, is that all right with everybody? I think there are a lot of possibilities for what you can talk about. Um, so I'm gonna open all rooms. Now, um, oh dear. Okay. Let's see, how do I put six people in each room or whatever? Is there an option for manual uh, breakout room? Does it have to be manual? Um, or uh, you can just um, choose six. Okay, I'll just choose the first six people, right? Um, okay, I have to assign them, all right. I'll assign to room one. Geez, I have to go through the whole thing. Okay, whatever. I'm sure that there's an easier way, but I'm sure that uh, Professor Beck has not figured it out. Um, this isn't too bad. This isn't uh, like we had last time. Three, four, I'll put about five of you in each group. Um, Let's see, one more. Okay. Oh, okay, so Hadil, you're not in a group? Oh yeah, you are, okay. Okay, new shot. Did you get assigned to a group or not? Okay, I think 
Love that picture. <laughs> Um, okay, so go ask, okay, Ashton has said that, uh, and in their group generally agree with Aristotle's definitions, but then the examples they had are specific to their culture, but the particular virtue that they focused on was magnanimity, that the rich do have an obligation to give back, to help. The poor so you can create a middle class but then they don't necessarily do that so okay Ashlyn take it away thanks so much so what I felt is I'm not sure like I'm not sure whether they are doing it out of their complete willingness but since they are obligated to do, to do that they are kind of going through uh, going back of their responsibility and what another point that raised with the same virtue so we had one of our group members from afghanistan she told this is kind of a barter system if we are helping people they are, like the rich people are supposed to get something back from the needy people like for example you have to serve them like you have to do work for them so that's kind of barter system that was an interesting point to us okay all right then general coming yeah coming to the virtue of generosity so one of our group members from syria she told um that is uh gifting people like when they are meeting or in often occasions it's kind of the it's, it's often to do because it builds a healthy relationship among people but what i have found in particular is that we won't gift um people very often to have a healthy relationships rather we'll have talks or something but what i found from our group discussion is that there is this culture which finds gifting makes a healthy relationship so that was an interesting point to us and again coming to the rational humor part the same uh, person told like there might be some generalized concept of accepting humor like this is this is humor and this uh, for this humor we are supposed to love but it won't be applicable in certain uh, places professor like the act generally accepted humor it can or it can often offend people so we should be clear about the about giving the definition of the so called humor as it it is having a chance of offending people so that is one of the other points that we have come out of and Okay, speaking about the truthfulness, uh, as you have already mentioned uh, uh, in the class, um, using religion as a tool of promoting the truthfulness, or I, I mean the dishonesty, since I myself could relate to your point. Uh, if we are questioning something that doesn't even make sense, like that makes zero sense, and we are questioning if it is not, um, you know, uh, it, it's completely it's completely out of our nerves and we, if we question it they'll be like no you are not supposed to question as it's god's will and you're supposed to follow everything as it is so i guess in that case it is promoting a dishonesty and another thing is um yeah the distribution of wealth what one of our members from bangladesh and which is very similar to india is india we have found out is the people who are um you know who are in because of corruption the wealth is not equally distributed so that's one of the points that we got and about the rectification of wrongs many of us could agree with the points just taking an example the people who are in the highest power or they are they are in the higher status of the society if they if they commit some crime it takes a bit longer time than the normal people to get punished because uh, they will be using their advantages or their power to get rid of the crimes that they have committed so that's about the rectification of wrongs and other all we kind of agreed with the virtues professor so this is some of the virtues that we could come up with like from a different point of view okay, i hope that good. that's great okay who's in number 2 it it goes alphabetically oh as as me 
I mean, she just gave four. me a reaction. <laughs> yeah, Thank I you. was reacting to her presentation. Oh, was that a clap? Was that clapping? Yeah, yeah. it was. A <laughs> okay, okay. I, I actually like to do the real thing, but you guys can clap. Uh, Thank you so much. Virtually, <laughs> virtually. <laughs> okay, so group number two. Hello, Professor. Okay. So uh, we had a lot of like uh, different point of views in our groups, like as we are diverse in culture and country. So we we started from the point of like name meeting, and like we got to understand like there's a uh, this kind of similarities in our countries. Like we were from Kashmir, Syria, and Timor-Leste, and we got to know like the thing that we are facing problem is the rich ones are not taking the responsibility that they should take as they have the more power. We, as we all see like the people who are more rich, kind of we say like they have the more power. And I, I, we, all, we all see it in a sense like we, we think like the people who are more rich should have more responsibility. And we talk about the recent thing about, we got to know in this pandemic, the, rich, the, the richest persons in the world, like uh, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and uh, other ones, they, we, I wrote, we all wrote and like read an article and it was supposed like in this pandemic, the rich ones got more richer. So we, we understand like, why is that happening in this pandemic? Okay, we got that they are, they are in a situation, they are dealing with technologies and they are super rich in their field. And there is a reason for getting, being more rich in this pandemic, but doesn't it supposed to be as they're more rich, they should have more responsibility for the well-being of others. Uh, they should be accountable for that as they have the power or they have the materials to do that. Um, and then uh, our uh, one of our friends, she was from Timor Leste. She said like uh, the the people in her country are very much concerned about that, and they are taking initiatives. And the regions are very much worried about the well-being of others. And so do Bangladeshi people are also doing that. But it's it's very less. It's like in a whole society, it's like one or two people who are very really rich and taking care of others and uh, being an efficient one in the society. But I want we are thinking like why we are taking it as a society. I think every, every individual should be concerned about that. In a society, it sometimes happens like one person is thinking like, okay, should I do this today? From today or not, they are waiting for others. Like if other person, if they're seeing others are helping out, then they're just going to start from their own. But we want everyone to act individually. And then it is going to be the point of being together as a society. So as a result, it will develop from individual to a society and then to a country. And it's going to help in many sector, in not just like one sector. And again, we also got to a point of political views. We think like the reason for being a developing country like Bangladesh and India is because like it's very corrupted in case of political views and in case of making laws. They are making laws that doesn't really make sense. Uh, sometimes it's just for making the citizen concern that we are concerned about the problems we are making laws but the citizens doesn't it doesn't really help the citizens it, it's just like they are making people's act or see like we are doing our jobs but they are not doing their jobs in the right way it's not helping anyone so uh, that's that's the thing we talked about in the group okay good um Okay, let's go to number three. Who is number three? Uh, I'm oh, guessing that we are. Are you? <laughs> Who is the leader of number three? Um, Professor, in our group, actually, we had a very good discussion and also uh, we had more things to add, but so first uh, we decided to share our opinions and uh, questions, then we can uh, help each other. Then we will decide, but the time was over and we could not- We didn't have the leader, leader, but we yeah. made the point. Yeah. yeah. So you didn't have enough so time. Many... <laughs> yeah, Professor. I, I thought that it this is over. 10 minutes or 15. I didn't realize that we just spent 20 minutes. It was very good. <laughs> so Mehwish, you can talk on behalf of us. Uh, okay, 
some of the points which I remember. So we started talking about rational courage, where uh, it was a good point made by the group members that uh, our actions should not be completely based on our fear. There should not be driven out of fear. At the same time, not also out of the fear of maintaining the social image of bravery, that you have to sustain that image that you're not covert. So the mild line where we our actions are not completely driven out of fear are the image of uh, not having fear, completely fearless. So it was a good point made. And another good thing that we discussed was a rational friendship. And we tried to make out points that how in bigger politics and uh, in other levels, it is something of value. And a basic example, uh, which uh, is like in politics, if you take example of countries like uh, India and Pakistan, so they have like their differences and some very like extreme differences in terms of ideology. And uh, if, we, if they pursue their actions completely based on these differences, then they're, both of the states, they are spending a lot in defense and everything. So what if they pursue a rational friendship where, yeah, they do disagree on a lot of things ideologically, but what if they find out a common way to negotiate and like renegotiate and then uh, do not concentrate on the differences, rather concentrate on some things that they have in common and pursue those things, it might be helpful in developing both. At the same time, uh, Masuma pointed out that uh, there could even be racial friendships uh, when there are no common, there is like, there are differences. So we can have the differences at the same time, the racial friendship, which uh, is helpful for both the parties. Yeah, and we also discussed a racial pride uh, where some good points were made that at times, it's if we look at pride in itself, if we define it individually, then it's very subjective. At times, the individuals might take pride in activities which that could be harmful to others. But if we define the pride based on certain social standards, then that could be good uh, for the whole society in general. And anything else, if I miss out, Masuma or other members who would like to aid? Uh, so yeah, about the rational pride, uh, Professor, I personally thought that uh, I'm, I'm not fully convincing uh, with the especially part he mentioned that the most meaningful contribution to social beings. So he uh, here is mentioning that we should, you know, honor citizens that make this kind of meaningful contribution to social being. Uh, but I think it's not always necessary uh, to always uh, to make most of meaningful contribution to social being because uh, given the in individual desire, sometimes we should, we should also, you know, uh, take into account those desires as well. So it's, I feel like this is more like a consequentialism view of <laughs> or utilitarianism view, which is saying that we should, you know, think about the well-being of all the society and, you know, sacrificing ourselves. So yeah, this was what I was, you know, concern about this point, then, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, group number four. Um, if my team is okay, um, we haven't decided on, on the spokesperson, but if, if my team is okay, um, I'd like to go ahead. Um, yes, of course. Roger? Okay, great. Yeah, um, Ajmi, you go. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Pooja. <clears throat> so, so right at the bat, we did not have enough time discussing all the points. We have just been able to discuss one, but even then I was dominating. <laughs> I apologize. Um, I, I was speaking throughout the whole time almost, and at the end, um, we have to leave the room. So I apologize to everyone my team um, yeah and and we quickly um, talked about some other points and I will be highlighting that as well so starting off with the point that we discussed elaborately was the formation of habit I think um, it's a collection of points I think uh, it's 
the second point, human condition and virtues, and the fourth point. So basically, we were talking about um, how habit is formed. And we kind of agree and kind of disagree on the point highlighted by um, Aristotle with respect to habit formation. So one of my team member named uh, um, Sauda, she was saying that she believes people are born with more or less a blank slate and you can basically, if, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm misinterpreting your message, Sauda, and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you're free to do that. Um, so what I understood is um, her stance on uh, the human condition is they're born as a blank slate and basically um, they, they're able to get input from the environment and learn from that <clears throat> and react accordingly. So what I understand from that um, stance is that eventually the person is not personally responsible for any of their actions. They're just the, a kind of sponge that they're absorbing these uh, stimuli <clears throat> and just reacting to it. So what I understood from that is if there's a criminal that had committed perhaps homicide, then if we are to have this um, belief that humans are just a collection of direct experiences and just, you know, that kind of black and white picture, then it would not be, we could not hold this criminal accountable for the homicide. So this is what I understood from Sauda's stance on human being a blank slate. Sauda, correct me if, if, if this is what you wanted to make um, us understand. Uh, yeah, the blank slate. We were born. So for me, I think we don't, so, so we don't have a sense of right or wrong when we are born. We learn it after. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so Okay. Anything else? Okay, so what I will say is that um, uh, we are going to cover utilitarianism and I'll show the similarities and differences between the ancient view of flourishing and modern utilitarianism. I will show the difference Bentham's view and John Stuart Mill's view and um, <coughs> you can think about that um, okay we, we also will talk about the blank slate because that is a modern enlightenment point of view John Locke is the one that was sort of connected to it but empiricism assumes that there's some things that are genetic but most of what you are is <coughs> by external forces. Um, um, yeah, we were professor, yeah. like, Sebastian got disconnected. Uh, so, like, we were yeah. kind of, like, agreeing to disagree on that point because for Sebastian, she, she thought that yeah. we have like, evolutions and, oh, you're back, you can see. Yeah, I got, uh, yeah, I lost electricity, so my laptop got disconnected. And I'm using my phone now. So I don't, you can, Sauda, sorry, you can go ahead if you like. No, it's okay. You, you explain your point. It will, I think, yeah. be. So uh, I was reacting to Sauda's point on the blank slate. And I thought people are, I mean, I personally am an ardent believer of the evolution theory. And I feel like we're just another kind of animal, however, perhaps a little more advanced. So I was talking about how through evolution, we, <clears throat> because, because living beings in general have the instinct to want to survive, right? Um, basically living life wants to survive and they do everything and anything to survive. And however, when they become more complex beings such as, our, as ourselves, um, sometimes, um, due to magnanimity, we sometimes decide that maybe our life is not more worth living and it's better for someone else to live. But this is 
for more complex beings as their standards of survival and understanding of survival becomes more complex. So yeah, going back to the fact that I believe through evolution, we develop certain instincts and therefore we're not born as a blank slate. We already have certain things instill, instilled within us and those installations are more with respect to survival. Anything related to survival um, is instant in, instilled within us. Um, so basically the, the, the whole, whole essence of living beings is, yeah, that, that's what I think living things want to survive and we do have that instinct. And we developed that instinct, instinct from what I understand is living beings um, communicate with their environment. They, um, yeah, they interact with the environment. They take inputs and they react to it. And by their reaction, they see what other input they're getting as a consequence. So I was, I gave the example of um, a person dipping their hand in a certain liquid and they find out that the liquid burnt their hand. So the person learns from this experience, they react to it by removing the hand because it's burning them. And they realize, okay, if I don't dip it the next time, I won't be burnt. So that was a kind of interaction. So if with multiple generations, this is an experience they encounter constantly, then from what I understand through evolution, what will happen is later down the line, people will not have to learn this experience um, through practical experience, but this, it, it will turn into an instinct within themselves. So they will right away by birth when they, when they get a sense of, um, yeah, themselves, they will avoid certain things uh, without knowing fully the consequences. They will have a certain fear instill, instilled within, within them, excuse me. <clears throat> so yeah, I was reacting to Salva's statement on the blank slate and I thought perhaps we're not a blank slate. We have certain things already in us. And Salva further reacted by saying, um, but then you would be making the point that we are dictated by genetics. And I, and I reacted back and I said, no, that's, that's not my point. I think there are certain parts uh, that are dictated by genes, such as these instincts, perhaps, I'm not too sure. Um, but yeah, I feel like humans are more complex. There are things that are dictated by genes. There are things that are dictated by the uh, practical experiences that we have and yeah. So coming back to habit formation, our take on, I'm sorry, I'm taking too long again. <laughs> I'm doing the same thing that I did in the breakout room. I apologize. Please stop me whenever I'm going off track or if I'm not making any sense. Um, so coming back to habit formation, um, we could agree on the fact that um, habit develops over time and it is through interactions with the environment. <clears throat> we're receiving stimulus and we're acting a certain way. And from that, we receive information and we're processing it. And we're doing everything <clears throat> to, to survive, basically. So people from, this is my personal take. I feel like people develop certain habits because they were in certain environments. And these habits developed over time because they were able to survive in those specific environments. And therefore people develop different personalities and different habits through experiences. Basically we agree with Aristotle's point of view on this, on the, um, the second and third and fourth point, um, speaking of virtues and habits. So this, is, this was the dominating <clears throat> thing we talked about in the breakout room. I wanna then highlight Puja's, um, yeah, Puja's reaction to the political thing. I'm not, I haven't made too many notes regarding this, but um, she mentioned that um, there are so many politics in place in society and these politics were perhaps constructed 
to go back to the first point, which is the goal, the main goal is to be happy. So these policies were in place so that um, maximum happiness was achieved, as in more people being happy in the society. I'm, I'm not too sure if this is the point you were making, um, Pooja. So correct me if, if yeah, I'm going. Yeah, you are going on track. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> and I'm totally on board with this, um, this idea that policies were put in place to maximize happiness and to have more people um, living a more fulfilling life. But then, um, but then who, who is this? I, I think Shukti. Shukti then highlighted that, but then over time, policies can break and instead of its main goal to maximize happiness, we um, it, the system of this the, the how the um, society works can fall apart if corrupt people uh, are responsible of making these policies because then they will only consider about their own well-being and to them society and all these higher purposes don't matter to them. And because of that, everything can go on a reverse and eventually the impact it will have on the society is um, people will forget that policies were in the first place to achieve greater happiness, but now because of the broken system, they'll feel like, why do we even have these policies in the first place? How did we come to this place? Maybe we shouldn't have any policies anymore. Maybe we should have individual freedom to the in, in the most extreme sense. And so what Shukti was highlighting in the chat box was, yeah, we were communicating in the chat box. So she highlighted that, um, yeah, we can, we can go backwards and it can have a huge impact in the society because people will fully forget why we are in this place, in, yeah, um, yeah, in this situation on the first place. Yeah, so that's, that's with regards to <coughs> politics and political virtues and uh, the goal of happiness. And then, um, yeah. I think, I think I'll think i stop you there, although. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you, guys. It, there is a, you know, an advantage to having a three hour class. I think that in this class, we can, you know, hold out. We can, there's a lot to talk about and we can last, we can stay active for the whole three hours. So let me just start with group one. When you were talking about um, religion can be intellectually dishonest. And when people say it's God's will. So the thing that's interesting there is that it's not just based on survival, right? Physical survival. It's amazing how human beings can get in their minds a notion of eternal salvation or damnation. And they can do things that no animal would do because it's self-destructive, right? They can, they do all sorts of crazy things. And so what really, I would say what really drives them is their ideas, their ideas of good and evil, their ideas of the ultimate goal of life, their ideas of happiness, and they can get ideas of happiness that really cripple their ability to flourish as a member of a species, right? So that's the thing. That's why in the ancient view, what you study is your idea of the good and your idea of justice, because that ultimately is driving you. Or you, you study the people who came before you and, um, how their ideas have affected you. So the, the obvious example to a bunch of women is the idea that women were incapable of the higher levels of thinking and leading, right? And you could say that was based on experience, but because, you know, John Stuart Mill, he could, you know, the people he disagreed with they would say, I've never met a woman who's interested in politics, right? They just don't care. And, you know, Mill had to say, wait a sec, is that because they're not capable or because they're never given a chance, right? And so culture, on the one hand, it can be powerful,
but it can never ultimately kill the fact that women have the same capabilities right? It can certainly prevent them from developing it for thousands of years, but at the last straw, it can't kill it. Uh, the same with minority, same with racism, the same. So these things will keep coming back. Um, but human beings are way more complicated. And part of what complicated Kate's it is that their ideas can drive them to do things that are on the surface, not at all related to survival. Um, let's see. The second group, okay. Another issue that came up a lot is the, the power of money, right? So the one group that talked about number three, India and Pakistan spending too much money on military. And so, and of course the US does that. So in, uh, in the Greek uh, storytelling, Paris, there's a young man coming of age. So again, young woman coming of age. And he has three choices in life for what is your ultimate goal? What do you want to organize your life around? That every other aspect of your life is going to be dri driven by achieving this goal your friendships, your sociability, your, you could go through the whole list, right? It could be just physical pleasure, self-indulgence. It could be wealth. And usually if you want indulgence, you're gonna have to get money. So that's one of the choices. The next choice is power or status or popularity. So, for example, a comedian might want, comedians can either educate people for critical thinking or they can vulgarize taste. Somebody mentioned, one of the groups mentioned that, the way comedy can be corrupted. Um, so a comedian can decide, will I do anything just to get money? Or will I do anything just to get whatever on Facebook, right? Influencers or whatever, whatever number of people on your page or whatever. So that would be status or power, or do I really wanna do this in a way that promotes critical thinking and promotes uh, the citizens being better at recognizing corruption and at rethinking a whole lot of their assumptions rethinking their habits. Um, all right, so those are the three main choices. Um, the love of justice, wanting to use your talents for the well-being of others, the love of virtue, the love of wisdom, or the love of status and power. Uh, and that can be military power also, or the love of pleasure. And corruption is when politicians, like by nature, their job should be using their authority for the well-being of everyone. When it's corrupt, they use it either to get money, you know, they exploit the whole system, they structure it or they apply it, um, they, you know, structure the economic system, they put their friends in, in the judicial system, Right, they can set the whole thing up to maximize their money or to maximize their power um, or both. Um, that's corruption. So if you rule for the sake of the ruler, if they use their power to help their friends and harm their enemies or help themselves, right? That's corruption. And I do, and people use the word corruption a lot, but I think it's good to recognize what the heck that means and how it's based on the human condition, pleasure and uh, power, fear, they will always exist because we have to experience pleasure to survive and we have to experience fear to survive. So every generation is just gonna come back, but you can still do it in a way that's better or worse. Um, let's see, oh yeah, another thing that um, 
I wanted to mention was the importance of journalism to report the corruption of the politicians. So um, group number two was saying during the pandemic, the rich are getting richer. Well, how does the public know that? Well, there's journalists that have written about it. And so again, it's really important that journalism does not get corrupted. And of course, Fox News, it, those people are corrupt, right? They will let their commentators say anything to make money. And, and that is a, a horrible influence, but it's the same pattern there, right? People need to be informed. Journalism, good journalism is based on the love of wisdom, the love of justice. And in order to get wisdom and justice, you have to have somebody constantly reporting which leaders are using their powers wisely and justly and which leaders are corrupting it. And they have to go get the evidence and they have to communicate, right? But when that gets corrupted by just a desire for being popular or a desire for getting wealthy, the whole society is crippled and it's hard to maintain a democracy without an honest journalism. I must say, I have a biased opinion. One of my children is a journalist. So, you know, all of a sudden I think journalism is really important. Um, let's see. Um, so let's see, group number three. Oh, the emphasis on fear, right? So I thought that was important to bring that in. And the pandemic, of course, has triggered a lot of fear buttons. And then there are these dishonest politicians who use that fear and tell the public they're going to take care of them. And in the meantime, they can cover up really what they're doing is helping their friends, right? And harming their enemies. Um, so Trump did that, but he's not the only one. Uh, it's just that people do have to learn a lesson coming out of the COVID era, not to let your judgment get corrupted by fear and trying to communicate to other people that lesson. So another thing that you can take with you because you're going through college during this COVID era is lessons learned, right? And so uh, you have to remember when you're my age and you're talking to your grandkids, right? You can say, don't let fear bother you. Let me tell you a story about when I was in college, <laughs> right? So, you know, because your grandkids, everybody, if they're well raised, when they're going to be raised around people that are trustworthy and that tell them the truth, and they're gonna go out in the world and it's gonna be a heck of a lot more complicated and people aren't, you know, they're gonna to have to learn these difficult lessons, right? People aren't always honest and all that stuff. Um, and so the, the function of a, a grandparent is to prevent them from becoming passive and feeling sorry for themselves, right? And not having courage and not still pursuing the full and complete life. So you can do that. You can be good grandmas. Just think it. You guys are going to have such great stories. I went to college and I lived through COVID. And so your grandkids don't feel sorry for yourself, right? You're a man for you're a boy. You got an advantage right away, buddy. You know? <laughs> so um so you know I think all that's important. And that's what wisdom literature is about that cycle of life, right? Um, so keep that in mind. Um, so the fear button. Oh yeah, the other thing about military is that, again, it's common sense to say that in order to maintain national security, which is important, but you need diplomacy, you need diplomats, you need intelligence and you need military and they need to be working together. And if you just think about it, nobody talks about this, right? Or they don't put the pieces together. So it's much, you should honor, it's much more honorable to prevent a problem 
through diplomacy. And so in the US too often, we honor the soldiers, which is fine. It's just that if you get kids growing up wanting to be a tough soldier and honored, you're gonna get wars that you don't really need, right? Because people wanna prove how courageous they are. Does that make sense? If you value military too much. And the military should recognize, they should say, yeah, well, we value diplomacy and intelligence. So intelligence gathering is really important because the diplomats are gonna fail unless they know from the spies whether the enemy is telling them the truth. So diplomats can't function without good intelligence gathering. And they together, they need to make sure they've got a military. So if they fail, then they can refer to the military, but they should all have a really healthy and truthful attitude toward what each one of them has to offer. And all of them are important. It's just that military is failed diplomacy, right? You only revert to war when your diplomats fail and they might fail because your intelligence gathering failed, right? And a good military is going to agree with that because they don't want to send their guys, put them in harm's way unnecessarily. Okay. So again, this, I think the thing I liked about reading this is it just makes explicit what's there. It's just, we don't see it because we don't explain it. And we have to get those definitions in our head to get the right picture of what's going on because uh, national security, oh, well, that's the fear button. And then people don't think straight anymore. And they just obsess about their enemy, right? Instead of figuring out, well, how do you solve problems? Um, all right. So the idea that friendships. So I was just looking at a little clip on the news and it was where the US uh, Mr. Blinken met with a Russian Secretary of State or whatever, and they're agreeing to disagree on some things, and then they're agreeing to work together on other things. And the little clip interviews these specialists in um, uh, international affairs, and they just say things like, yeah, I mean, we don't have to be friends. We don't have to agree on everything in order to solve the issues. So literally they were saying that and I was just watching it like half an hour before class. So if anybody wants any of these little clips, you know, I, I easily, what I do is um, save them, send them to my email and I just put them over in a little folder. So if I'm ever referring to one of those things I saw and you would like to look at it, uh, just let me know and I'll just forward it to you. But I don't want to keep pushing things onto students and it just gets too complicated. Um, okay, let's see. So we will, we are going to cover utilitarianism. And so actually utilitarianism was based on a complete rejection of Aristotle. So that's what I think you need to know just in terms of the way these ideas have developed. Because you can say that's not common sense, but if you wanna understand why the US behaves the way it does, you do need to know this history behind their behavior and the way they explain things to themselves. But I don't think it's just the US, I think it's the West in general and how they, you know, the relation between developed countries and developing countries. So I, that's why I think you need to know this intellectual history. Um, and I think when you take those classes where like ethics, you have utilitarianism, you have deontology and you have what, it doesn't give the historical context. And that's what I, that's what my class gives you because I do think it's important. Um, another thing I wanted to say which we will cover in this class, is that Aristotle's position is not moral relativism, right? It acknowledges 
that cultures um, you were talking about, right? Differences between your cultures, but there's similarities and there's differences, right? So um, it's not a co absolute, you have to have the blank slate theory to think moral absoluteism, right? Everything is just absolutely relative. That became a, a deal during the enlightenment. That's not, Aristotle would say we have these basic drives and some cultures do a better job of assimilating those drives and preventing overreactions than other cultures. So the way a culture habituates people can, can promote more integrity and flourishing or less. For example, in our society right now, we've decided to worship greed and to think that greed is good because it's gonna create a bigger economy. But all it's really done is create a whole lot of dysfunction and animosity. And um, the Greeks would say, that's really stupid. <laughs> and yeah, we have a lot, I mean, we have extreme polarization, right? And that's related to this worship of money. Um, so it's not relativism, but it does allow for context. It's not moral absolutism, because that's another, that's the enlightenment uh, rationalism. Uh, Immanuel uh, Kant had, there are moral absolutes, right? So an example of that would be abortion, right? Oh, absolute, you know, we and what a, a person with practical wisdom would say is that the issue is whether or not it should be legal or illegal, right? And so the absolutists say, ah, oh, it's killing the innocent, illegal. And um, the person of practical wisdom will say, look, if you want fewer abortions with an S, if you really want to minimize the number of abortions, you should keep it legal. You should have contraception available and you should have sex ed for teenagers. That's how you minimize the number of abortions, okay? And so that would be an Aristotelian approach is that let's maximize flourishing, right? But an absolutist approach, nope, should be illegal no matter what, right? And what happens in the, the Republican party is that they get a lot of votes for that, okay? but they also have all these policies that lead to actually more abortions. So they don't worry about uh, poverty programs. And the reason women get abortions is because they can't afford another kid or because they're teenagers and they're pregnant. <laughs> so, you know, all the yelling about absolutism in the world, if you don't work on poverty and you don't work on teenage pregnancy, you're going to get more abortions. So, um, so that's, do you understand that's just one example of a different way? Now, utilitarianism is obsessing so much about consequences. Well, you can't anticipate consequences so, uh, lots of times. And so at a certain point, you just, um, you, you do what you think is best because you think it's best and you can't worry about anticipating all of the consequences because it's way too complicated. Um, but anyway, I can get into that. Uh, oh, well, I, okay, I'll give you another example of some students at Lyon. They, there was another school shooting, right? We have, and again, uh, gun rights, it's an absolute principle. Well, everybody's dying, you know? Couldn't we just have some laws that's the utilitarians. We want laws that will minimize murder. And the other side, nope, it's the principle of the thing. And um, sometimes you just have to make a law that's a good law for minimizing the number of murders, but you can't predict it exactly, right? But the Democrats tend to be utilitarian. They tend to go out and get the data and find out what's the trajectory 
for which laws would minimize uh, the number of murders. But there are some students at my school when there was another school shooting, right? On, apparently on Facebook, they say, the reason why we have all these shootings is because we made abortion legal. And so we don't respect life. And that's why we're murdering everybody. I was like, okay, so that's a utilitarian argument, right? And it's like, it's not data-based, but I'm mentioning it just because this is what deliberation is. This is what Aristotle in theory is talking about what we actually do when we actually talk to each other about human affairs. So it's not relativism, it's not absolutism. It takes the human condition. Uh, if the human condition to some extent, survival doesn't change, but then culture is like a second nature. It has a lot of power in molding people, but not ultimately, right? Um, so uh, let's see. What else do what I want to say? Um, all right, so I think I'll go over. We have about an hour more. Why don't why don't you all take a break for five minutes? A yes, <laughs> and I'll, I will remember to pause. Bravo, Dr. Beck remembered. And then you remind me if I don't remember to turn the recording on again. All right, five, take five guys. Okay, so the next section of the class, I'm going to page through that long letter and just pick out, show you that Seneca had in mind, that basic list of virtues and the human condition, the way that Aristotle understood it. And if you want to write your first paper, and you can even write it early if you want to, but if you might consider thinking of writing a letter to a friend or writing a letter to yourself, <laughs> there are lots of middle-aged people that talk about uh, writing a letter to their college age self and telling that person, you know, don't, you know, don't lose confidence or do this, don't do that. You know, what I wish I had known at the time, right? So you could you could write a letter to yourself if you want to, um, but just that kind of reflective consciousness. So the other thing I was gonna mention was um, that this particular tradition focuses on reflective consciousness. And um, just to give you th that example of how national security is an issue and people talk about it. But you have to step back to look at military, intelligence, and diplomacy working together. So in your daily life, what you do is cognize. You, you study what Pakistan is doing, what India is doing, you check the data, whatever. But when you're, when you're thinking about this bigger picture stuff, you, that's called re, recognition, right? The word recognition, if you think about, it, we have a number of words that are basically the words of culture. Culture is that stepping back and organizing cognitions, recognizing patterns, and then based on those patterns, trying to structure a flourishing society. So you have recognition, recognition, you have remind, remind yourself, right? So you're cognizing and all this, and then you have to remember that you have a mind, right? And what do I think about this? And what is my idea of the good? And then um, remember. So member means you have all these members, but remember is understanding the pattern. So the Greek focuses on pattern recognition. But all of those words, culture is about pattern recognition. 
And all, we, we use a number of words that are basically, they are the words of reflective consciousness, but we use them without thinking about what we're doing. Um, so, all right, so I will talk a little bit about that letter and then I will uh, go through a little bit the letter that my former student, he was from England, he wrote to his friend and then I'll go through my list of all the different types of suffering. So compared to the AUW students, I've had a pretty cushy life. I understand that. And um, I am happy, you know, I'm privileged to be able to give back something. But compared to, okay, my goal in life, right? In college, I want to love wisdom and I want to love justice and I want to do all these good things. And then I ran into all these obstacles. <laughs> and when I was 30, no, 28 years old, I got pregnant the third time and neither my husband or I had a job. <laughs> I was like, whoa. And I kept thinking, I just want to be good and I just want to help people and I can't even survive. Like, what is this? Um, and so I felt like, oh my God, I can't help anybody. I can't even get on my feet on the ground. But what I figured out later was that it gave me more empathy uh, than I otherwise would have, right? I had to have gone through some unjust suffering before I would have any understanding of other people. So I have an expression that show me somebody who by age 40 has never suffered unjustly. And I'll show you somebody who has no mercy, who's judgmental, who doesn't have any understanding of people or the human condition because they've been too protected from suffering. So, <laughs> so while you're going through all your unjust suffering, you can try to remember right, that it will give you a lot more insight when you take on a job and you start figuring out how to govern and how to treat people. You will have a lot more, you know, in the back of your mind to draw from um, than a lot of other people because your trajectory is to, to, to have substantial professions, right? But you might find that the people you work with we're a lot more protected than you and they don't get a lot of stuff. And so I think, again, you could really make a great contribution because you are literally pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. And if you get high enough, you're gonna be with people who really didn't. And they might be more judgmental because they don't understand. Um, but anyway, so, so that's why this, the, I go through that list about suffering. I used to go through it in my head. <laughs> okay, why am I suffering this time? Is it something I did or is there anything I did, right? Am I responsible for this? Um, okay, so here's the letter and finally in a readable form. Um, I would say just I picked out three pages for you to read. If you just read a few pages and let me know in your post that you read a little bit of it, I just want you to get a feel for it. So three pages, five pages, that's plenty. Um, but I do think it's worth reading some of it. So what happens is Serenus is describing his state of mind. And Aristotle's whole ethics is about finding the mean between extremes. It's about learning to take pleasure in doing good things, take pleasure in being noble. Um, and so Serenus is in this, um, what was the word for it? He's conflicted. The, the contemporary word is more like conflicted or he has cognitive dissonance, right? Um, and so he's writing to his friend. He wants advice from his friend Seneca. 
And he starts out saying, as a physician, you can help me because the Greeks assume that there's a complete integrity between your mind and your body. So mind, body, and spirit are never split. So if you have the wrong ideas and you're vacillating, that's the word, you're vacillating in your ideas of good and evil and justice, your, your body is going to emit certain chemicals and you're going to be unhealthy physically. Um, and that's proven to be true. A lot of, a lot of recent research sort of heads in that direction. So um, I remember when I was getting divorced, I got really dizzy and I ended up in the hospital. And basically what I had is divorce-itis, you know? I mean, my ideas about my life were so blown up that it physically got so that I was really dizzy a lot of times. Um, but that happens, you know, those kinds of things happen to people all the time. It's not anything unique to me. Um, all right, so he's, he's asking for advice. He, um, he has this weakness of mind. So the goal is strength of mind. The goal is that you have a good uh, idea of the human good and a good idea of how to get there. But it's not a fixated idea. Every morning when you wake up, you sort of have to adjust or you adapt or you have to respond to certain, all the contexts that you respond to. Um, it's not absolutism. It's just constantly trying to maximize flourishing. So um, the weakness of mind. So on the one hand, he says, I like to live frugally. I don't like to have a lot of stuff. It's very distracting. But sometimes when I see somebody who's rich and they have this banquet all set up, I'm conflicted, right? I'm sort of a little jealous or a little resentful or a little judgmental, right? I, I don't have complete integrity. I'm not at peace with myself. I have to have some sort of emotional reaction and that's causing me uh, uh, vacillation and it causes me a lot of grief. Um, let's see. So you got you all can think about examples where you think you're self-controlled or you think you're courageous or you think you're generous or whatever, and then you have these conflicts. Um, you can't achieve integrity. All right, then there's another question of when you see people behaving in all these irrational ways. Um, Sometimes you just want to go home and go to bed in fetal position and forget about it, right? I just don't want anything to do. You can become mis misanthropic, like you hate people. <laughs> people are, ah, they have this ability to flourish and they don't do it. They make all these stupid choices. So he says, on the one hand, I, you know, I sometimes I just want to go home and not go out at all, not help anybody. And then other times I just wanna go out there and do all sorts of stuff. I wanna take charge and way beyond my capacity to do so. And um, sometimes uh, when I'm, I decide to stay home and, and read books, right? But if you just read books just to escape, that's not the mean, right? That's not flourishing. If you read books in order to learn and to live a better life, fine. But to go home and to read as a kind of escape, no, that's not rational. That's not mindful. Um, on the other hand, if you go out because you're gonna help people and you just go in there, that's not, that's not mindful either. That's not necessarily gonna help anybody. Um, so Seneca says, you know, okay, I'm going to try to calm you down, get you focused. The goal, the goal is always, you know, stability of mind, strength of mind, complete human excellence, flourishing. 
And so I'm gonna try to give you some advice about how to achieve this, what things to avoid, what things to emphasize. Uh, one big issue is being small-minded, if you remember sociability. Um, so keep your focus on the big picture. Don't be fickle, don't overreact in situations. Um, and don't shift your purpose, right? Constantly shifting your purpose. You have this one purpose, right? It's just that it varies. What you vary in is what you think you should be doing to achieve that purpose. But always having to change your purpose is just gonna lead you into internal decline. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay, boredom. Being bored is a sign that you don't know who you are and you don't know what you want. Um, all right, I'll tell you what this letter, I've, I've been reading this and teaching it for decades, but I think that since the era of the iPhone and the Facebook and social media, it's really rank, uh, ramped up right? People really can distract themselves and they really can get obsessed about drawing attention to themselves, wanting to solve all the world's problem by posting their opinion on Facebook. <laughs> Does that make sense? It's just like all the same problems, but um, on steroids, okay? Or they can People can go watch any old movie and, you know, Netflix and whatever and distract themselves. And the whole pandemic has, again, ramped everything up. And so uh, people, some people have just been totally bored during the pandemic. Other people have actually educated themselves, you know, developed themselves in other ways. I can imagine that uh, Seneca would be saying, well, you should use the pandemic as a way to become more aware of your capacity for reflective consciousness and to cultivate that so that when you finally get out back out in the world, that's a tool that you have, right? Um, anyway, so you can write yourself a letter. You could write about how the trends in this letter are even more um, pronounced in the world of uh, phones and the web and social media and the pandemic and all these other factors. Um, oh, okay. Masoma, go ahead. Uh, yes, Professor. I wasn't able to read uh, the Seneca later last, uh, last night. So, yeah. Um, uh, so my question was that whether Seneca is mentioning about any final end that every human being is pursuing or... Okay, actually his goal is to maximize flourishing, right? So he's telling, if you remember all those virtues, they're the personal virtues, the political virtues, and the intellectual virtues. So he's telling him... Um, you might want to go out there and do citizenship and engage in uh, political life, but you have to do it for the right reason in the right way at the right time. So you can do, you can go in over your head, you can be overly ambitious, or you can just get so discouraged and stay home and read books and forget about it. Um, and that's being less ambitious than you should be. That's refusing to participate in public life. Um, does that make sense? Uh, yes, yeah, professor, it makes okay. sense. Okay, thank you. But actually, the question was fine because it forced me to just be a little bit more specific. Um, all right, let's see. Um, okay, so we haven't been able to go outside and travel. I mean, even get outside, right? So, but on the one hand, you need to get out to have stimulation because naturally we like to take stuff in and learn. On the other hand, um, people can travel just to travel and they don't learn anything. And um, 
all they do is use a lot of carbon. <laughs> they increase their carbon footprint. That's about all they do. And it doesn't really help anybody. Um, the, the, another issue is you can never run away from yourself. So the idea of know yourself and have integrity is something that you really have to cultivate in addition to um, any other list of things you do. So in the US, we tend to judge ourselves by how much we do, like right? our CV, like how long is your CV, you know? And, um, you know, this, this point of view is not about that. If I tell, I ask my students, I say, what would happen if you were on Monday morning, you saw your friend and you said, I had a great weekend. I sit, I sat and stared at a wall all weekend <laughs> and got myself focused, right? Would, would your friend say, ah, wow, that sounds really good. <laughs> no, they'd probably say you're weird or uh, you must be depressed or something like that. So Americans tend to judge each other by how much power they have, by how successful they are, by how long their CV is, and without any other purpose other than to be able to list their accomplishments. Um, and he's saying, no, you know, that's not it. That's not mindful living. Um, let's see. Um, ambition. So there's the word ambition, right? Too many people are too ambitious. They're ambitious for the wrong reason in the wrong way. They want more than they want to, they want to overachieve as opposed to find out what they would be really good at and achieve at the level that they're good at. So he talks about ambition. He talks about honor. Um, so there's certain jobs you could get that would be honorable and honored but you shouldn't worry about being honored. You should worry about whether you can do the job well and whether it's the best thing for you to be doing. Um, another big issue they talk about, of course, is friendship um, and how important friends are. Um, virtue, though obscured, is never concealed, right? Give signs. So people can spot a person. So the Here's the difference between, I think, utilitarianism and the ancient view. The utilitarianism focuses on behavior and behavior modification. So the idea is that if you can put in positive and negative reinforcements, like people were talking about, uh, group number three, you can get people to behave differently. And, but the Greeks would say, people are not behaviors, right? When you look at a person behaving, you truly do not know what you're looking at because you, you're, you don't know what that really is unless you know why they're doing what they're doing. So one person could be giving money away because his girlfriend uh, will sleep with him if he shows her how generous he is. <laughs> or somebody else is giving money away because they want to get a better job. And so they have to have this status, right? They have an ulterior motive. But other people will do it just because it's the right thing to do. Some people will do it without having adequate research to do a, a good job of it just because they wanna to prove to themselves they have good intentions. And another person will do it because they've studied it, they've decided what their country needs or what they have to offer. I mean, one person is, that behavior is actually an example of phronesis. Another person, it's not, right? It's a tragic good intentions or it's greed or it's power or it's, uh, some sort of friendship, um, ulterior motive. Okay, so Nujat, go ahead. I, I have something to say about um, distribution of wealth or about why rich people do chat. 
in my opinion i think um the altruistic behavior that people generally have is um something which is which varies from people to people there are people who uh, are more altruistic in nature and they actually donate or do funding uh, uh, donate their wealth because they find a sort of happiness in that this find a sort of peace in that i mean they are not doing it just because uh, just for the cause of helping people they are doing it for themselves in fact because when someone is donating something to people or to poor people who are in need of that they feel a sense of um um this is the feel a sense of happiness or achievement they feel like there's something they they are try, doing something so that also has a selfish motive behind i what i am trying to say here is that nobody does anything without own benefit everybody has a certain ben motive behind doing anything okay. it's not just completely to help and to just completely to help other people Actually, that was great that you brought that up because it um, you pointed out basically an important point that I haven't yet mentioned that I should have. So in the modern context, and again, when we read uh, Bentham and Mill, we you have this selfish versus altruistic, right? Self-oriented versus other-oriented. Okay, the Greeks don't do that. They say a well-habituated child is, there's no, they don't see any gap between exercising their own virtue and relating to other people in a positive way. So you can't really be yourself without being generous <clears throat> for the right reason and the right. So there's no self versus other. It's you can't even be a human being unless you're actually being generous and being and having those virtues. So it was later on where that was split because later on there's a focus on individuals and individuality. That's the starting point. Whereas in the ancient view, where culture is a second nature, we're actually social and political beings. And so when you get habituated, so it's second nature for you to be generous and to be, you know, thoughtful. Um, you're not going to see any any difference, or you take you take pride in doing what's noble because it's noble without ulterior motives, right? That's that's when you know you're really being fully human. Um, does that help, Nushat? I mean, does that make sense to you? Okay. So that was another thing I liked about the Greeks because, because I, I just think it's unhealthy to think that every time you help somebody, you have to distinguish between selfishness and altruism. I, <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so that, yeah, I am, anyway, that's enough. Okay. Um, Let's see, what else does he talk about? Uh, the, the option of going into public office or private life, which is better? Well, it depends upon the situation, depends upon who you are. There might be times when it's the better judgment to go this way or that way. Uh, you just have to think about it and keep an open mind. You don't ever make a final decision. Um, Okay, you just have to be careful about what's what is it that's your fault and what of it, what is it that's you can't control. Um, let's see, I do need I need to move on here, but um, all right, I just the main point is that you could dig out, you could tell that um, both of them have that chart of the virtues in the back of their minds. Uh, even right at the end, um, he talks about, yeah, money is a big problem. Um, so the Greeks thought greed was a terrible problem. The writer of this letter thinks greed is a terrible problem. Um, 
fortune, luck. You shouldn't depend on luck. You should structure your life to minimize the influence. Everybody is affected by good luck and bad luck, but you can still structure your life to avoid unnecessarily depending on luck. And also then you can um, reflect on, okay, this was just a matter of bad luck and I can endure it. I have enough strength of mind to um, accept that, that that's, that happens in life. So right toward the end, he even tells uh, Serena's to get drunk. <laughs> I don't, uh, okay, so um, it frees the mind from bondage to cares. It emancipates it and gives it new life and makes it bolder. Um, yeah, but as in freedom, so in wine, there is wholesome moderation, right? Uh, but every once in a while, you can go whole hog. All right. Um, I do not, uh, I don't drink, but I, but I don't have hangups about it. I'm not judgmental about it. Um, all right, so that's the letter. And um, I would like you to just make, just read three pages or so from it and just let me know that you at least eyeballed it a little bit. You could have you can make a specific point from page 13, or you could just eyeball it and say, okay, I kind of understand this. Another point that you should um, be more aware of is that it is sexist, right? It's the point of view of a man in a society that's driven by men. And so there's nothing about women per se. And, and when I read this stuff, I identified with it. I didn't think it was just about men. It wouldn't have occurred to me because I thought about political things and I thought about these things. But then I had children and I, I got stuffed into these roles and people thought stuff about me. And all of a sudden I realized that, no, you know, um, this, that, the consciousness that he's projecting is something that is easier for men to achieve because of male domination. And so all of you will have to sort of wrestle with all of that stuff. Uh, if you don't have children or if you don't have them till you're well established, it won't be as bad. But if you have them when you're younger, it it's hard because the society will keep trying to drive you into places where you don't necessarily want to go. Okay, here's the letter from Miles. He's a letter to Joe and he's quoting a little bit. So you could have um, something like this. Um, he's trying to speak truthfully, right? And he his main thing with his friend is that on the one hand, his friend is honest but he's underachieving. He, I think he's a roofer, but he does a lot of drinking and he just obsesses about Manchester United, the soccer in England. Um, and he wants his, his friend to um, live a more complete life. Um, and Miles also was really interested in consciousness, the nature of consciousness. So, um, this is, Aristotle has a more structured view, but this is a fine view, right? And the, the punchline of it is, you don't have to know everything and you don't have to have some belief about the true meaning of life, no matter why we exist or the genesis behind it, we can all understand that if we collectively work together to change society for the better, um, there will be no need to think about external phenomena, about uh, whether you're being effective or whether you're gonna go to heaven or whatever. Um, as a big part of trying to understand meaning is that a lot derives from suffering, you can learn from suffering. If we focus more on internal and what exists inside the present, externalities will work themselves out. So. He, you know, he comes to the ultimate conclusion that we ought to work together 
and make society better, even if it, you don't have a whole lot of big, um, you don't do it for God or you don't do it for any sort of absolutist point of view. It's just his particular brand of humanism. And there's lots of brands of humanism. Um, and then this is my outline of all the different reasons that we suffer, the causes behind our suffering. And um, so we only have 15 minutes left. So I think what I'll do is try to take some notes on this and then perhaps at the beginning of the class next time or at some point in the first breakout session, I would like you to talk to each other about these different kinds of suffering. You might want to comment overall on what's the value of systematizing it. Um, I think there's a lot of value because it's important that you understand the cause behind suffering because if there, it's something you can control, then you can control it. If it's something you can't control, you let it go and you just learn how to be resilient. Um, there's just, I don't know, I personally think it's important. And I, I always kept asking myself, like, why am I doing this? Why am I suffering like this? What did I do? And I go back, okay, I did this and this. Did I do something to make that person treat me that way? Was there something I did? Maybe yes, maybe no, but I, I, I don't see how you can, I don't see how people can live without making those distinctions. Um, anyway, so just try to have some kind of reactions and, um, and then you can talk about that in your groups next time. So, so some kinds of suffering is physical and that's just because of the human condition, but some of our health is the result of our choices. Some of it is luck. So I inherited good genes, like I'm sort of naturally healthy. My mother lived till she was 95. Um, and so I always felt like I wanna make my choices to stay healthy because I'm grateful that I was born with health. So I do try to, you know, exercise and eat and all that wonderful stuff, just as a matter of gratitude, right? I was given this, I definitely uh, want to uh, show my gratitude for this. I also live in a country where there is healthy food and where I can afford it. I mean, all these other things that, that it's, a, it's a different attitude, right? It isn't sort of, oh, I wanna look good in a swimming suit or something, so I'm not gonna eat bad food. That's not the, that's not the motive. Um, let's see. So sometimes people get sick because of their choices. Sometimes it's their inheritance. Um, and so they have to develop uh, tranquility about it. If you were born with a genetic problem, they have to just accept that and live a full life within that context. Sometimes it's luck, like you just happened to, you know, be at the wrong place in the wrong time and get hit by a car and like have a permanent back problem or something. Um, and sometimes it's your choices. So just going over that in your head will help you figure out, you know, how to, how to think about strength of mind. Um, Sometimes it's the people before you, it's the people around you who cause the suffering and sometimes it's people who live before you. So um, in our country, a lot of people are making money selling food that really makes you sick. And so you do have a choice, but the food is addictive. It's designed to chemistry, I mean, the chemistry of the food is designed to hit the chemistry of the body and make people overeat. So you just have to be really careful about that. Um, and then of course, all of you are born into societies with pollution and all these problems. That isn't your fault, right? But you do have to cope with it. So then you could at least try to live in a way where at least as far as I can, can which is not very far, but I will try not to do things 
that will pass on these kind of problems to the next generation. Because I know what it's like when the previous generation did not take care for me. Um, I feel bad because I had hoped I would be able to go visit my students like where they live and meet their parents and I can visit these countries. I thought that would be great. But I have a, I have a allergic, I'm allergic to the pollution and um, I get so I can't breathe. And so I just can't go to the cities that are over polluted, which a lot of my students live like Dhaka. I could never go to Dhaka. I had a reaction even in Chittagong, which is way less polluted than Dhaka. But anyway, pollution, air pollution is just a huge problem. Um, so what about accidents? Some things are just happened accidentally. It wasn't your fault. Um, and then the key there is not to get discouraged, right? The universe is what it is. You still have a mind, you can still use it. Then there's natural disasters. Um, it's not God's will that people happen to be where um, a hurricane hits. Um, so some of those natural disasters are just accidental. You happen to be in the wrong place. Some of them are really by choice and arrogance. People who live in California right on the fault line. I mean, when there is an earthquake, they can't blame God, right? Oh, it must be God's will. It must be. No, you know, you chose this. This is ridiculous. Uh, actually, my daughter lives in Los Angeles, so... <laughs> I mean, you live there because there's a good job there, or you live there because you were born there. But in my country, when the when there is the big earthquake, there are going to be plenty of people talking about God, and I I think that's crazy. Um, environmental disasters are the product of human choices. We know better, and we still keep destroying the world. Um, let's see. All right, then there's psychological suffering that's caused by people's ignorance of the, our place in the universe um, and by people's mistreatment, right? Um, all right, so you suffer because you want to believe you're more powerful than you are or because you want to believe you're wiser than you are. Um, so that's uh, stupid and unnecessary, and you should think about it. Then there's interpersonal, right? We depend on each other a lot, and love is a need. That's why we love each other, because we depend on each other. And But the trouble with that is that people hurt each other. They don't always get it right. And so we suffer when people make mistakes. Um, and so we have to reflect on these relationship breakdowns, and what we can and can't do. What's the source of the problem? What can any? What can you do to prevent it or to fix it? And what do you just have to let go because the other person is unable or unwilling to um, behave appropriately? Um, the des desire to escape suffering is just a disease. It's very unhealthy. It just creates more suffering. So a perfect world inevitably includes a lot of suffering. So this is the stoic argument for this. And I'm not going to go over it because I have like two minutes. But then there's other suffering that's caused by injustice, right? Children who grow up crippled by racism, sexism, poverty, abusive parents, disease, or oppression. So a lot of that is unnecessary. Some of that is unnecessary. And that should motivate people to want, as adults, to want to do what they can do to make their societies less racist, sexist, um, driven by greed, et cetera. There, you know, there are really excellent reasons to be motivated to make the world a better place, even if your powers are limited and um, other people, you know, you can't get discouraged. Um, people grow up, children can grow up crippled by excess wealth, right? And um, by situations 
that they can't control. All right. The corruption of the legislative. Okay, so people get um, harmed by hatred, by the creation of a, a dysfunctional social norms, culture, uh, a dysfunctional legal system, a dysfunctional judicial system, uh, dysfunctional uh, police force, all that sort of stuff. Um, and you can always work to make it better. So that's, that's the idea behind all these different causes of suffering. Um, all right. So we're, um, I think there's ten, five minutes left. And then I will stay up long enough to be able to send you this via email. But I won't stay up long enough to be able to download it on YouTube because it takes I don't know, 15 minutes or something. Uh, but you can get it, you can get it in 10, 12 hours or something. Um, any other questions? I will, uh, yeah. Yeah, Professor, uh, can you uh, uh, quickly in a, in a recap about like what we need to write in our post okay. and the format and how and okay. where we'll be submitting it? So your yeah. post starts out with three thoughts you had before class, um, comments, think, reactions, but because that letter was so difficult to read, uh, you don't have to do that, that's fine. So you could have instead, you could have five points that you learned from your the other students in the breakout group or from the class. So five things that you learned during the class and then your reflection at the end. What is your final takeaway from this particular class and reading? Um, in terms of what you think a healthy psyche is, right? Because ultimately you're gonna write a paper on what is my view of a healthy psyche? So did you get some insights about unhealthy psyche or healthy psyche? So. There's five points of just that you learned from the class discussion. And then there's your final takeaway at the end. And it should be at least 500 words. Yes. I a lot more than that. Thank you for asking because that, that is important. And Professor, do we just email you? You post it, no. There's the assignments are all posted on Google Classroom. Yeah, so do we post it in the comments or just make a separate post? Post it on the classroom. It has assignments. Oh, okay. That's... Yeah, because then the actually the machine will keep a record of the grades and it is a lot easier for me. I used to have to do it all by hand. Um, Okay, is that is that clear to everybody? Does everybody sort of understand that? Okay. So, Professor, this will be our first assignment, right? This, yeah, I think I think this should be the first assignment. Okay, Masoma. Uh, yes, Professor. So, uh, how much time do we have to submit that one? So. Oh, a very good when is the due? question. What I wanted to say was that the assignments will be due approximately three days after the actual class day. And the reason for that is I don't want you to get too far behind. But on the other hand, today, for example, you might be particularly busy and you can't get it done before the next class. That's fine. So approximately three days. So today is whatever day it is. I don't know. Is it Wednesday, your day, or Tuesday? Uh, Tuesday. It's Tuesday. So. OK. So Tuesday, it would be posted by Friday. OK. Um, again, I'm not going to grade you down because I, don't, I know you're under a lot of stress. I'm not going to punish you. But, uh, on the other hand, it would be nice to be able to read them all together um, and I don't, and I, I want to at least give you some heavy 
suggestions so you don't get too far behind. That's that's it. Yes, um, Professor, so I think you need to create an assignment on the Google Classroom because oh. I just checked right now. So right now there is no, no assignment for like, okay. us to submit. Okay, so I created one for the first day and I said it was optional. Um, I mean, there's only like a post and attachment from you, but I think there's okay. separate. Okay, I will create an assignment. Um, and thank you for pointing that out because I, I don't always get that straight. Any other questions? I mean, every single question has been a good question. So um, be bold with your questions. Um, Okay. Okay, so people are saying I can totally relate exactly. Yes, is that? Oh, I see. So you're emailing each other. Good. Um, all right, that's great. Let's see, what does it say? Can you recap what we need to write? Okay, so I did that. All right, I think it's time to go. Um, have a good day. I'll have Thank a good you. Bye, 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 professor. Have a good day. Bye, 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 bye. Okay. Oh, so Fardeen, haven't I added you? I thought I added you. Um, professor, uh, I want to add this as a third course, so I just need to, uh, if you uh, allow, uh, reply to my email, I'll just forward that to the registry so that they add oh. my third course. Oh, okay. I didn't know that that's how it worked. Okay, professor. I, sorry for interruption. So the same case is with me because I want to add this course as a third. So uh, I need to inform IT or academic registry to put this in my portal. It's still last night I checked, but it is not mentioned in the portal. Okay, so what's the address? Is it IT? I mean, what I want to do is- Academic registry. Academic registry, okay. What I'm, yeah, NCC, Miss Anika. It's Anika. Okay. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to send her a complete list of all the students in the class so that it's Thank not you. just one by one. It's just the yeah. whole shebang. I think it'd be easier for her. And That um, sounds better. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank Professor. you, Professor. Have a good day. Yeah, well, thank you for bringing all this stuff up because it really helps me. Yeah, I just don't know the rules of the road here, so. Hello, Professor. Professor. Yes? I, I also want to add this class. Yep, I've got your name down. I mean, I think I have you all in Google Classroom and I have you all on the contact list. So I'm just going to go through that whole thing and send it to Anika. Thank you. Sure. Uh, hello. Uh, so uh, yes. Uh, Professor, do we, uh, I mean, do I need to give my ID to you? I mean, as you were sending the list to Miss Anika. So do we need to give our ID, student ID to you? I don't know. Oh. Um, if that's true, then it gets a lot more complicated. I, th um, I will just try doing it this way. And then um, if she says I have to have the IDs, um, what I'll do, I know what I'll do. I'll send it to her and I'll send it to my whole contact list. And so each of you can give her your ID number through that collective email. Oh, okay. okay. All right. So Diana, you also have Rania on the picture too. Um, yes, Professor. <laughs> I like her too. I like them all so much. Anika, Rania. And, oops, yeah, I'm Professor, so hope to meet you one day. I'm not supposed to refer to them according to their first name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but they're all the age of my 
know they're running the world now. And I've always, I have what I call mama karma. Ever since I traveled around the world without even thinking about it. Or I go to a conference and I, I think, oh, I'm going to go. That looks like an interesting person. They always end up to be the age of my children. It's just very bizarre. <laughs> so I have mama karma. Somebody is the age of my kid and I just go. <laughs> it's our pleasure, <laughs> Professor, to have you. Good. I just hope the best for all of you. That's all I can say. Again and again. Thank you, Professor, for being here. Well, I also, actually, I asked my daughter if she wants to come to AUW and give a talk about journalism. And yeah, she does. So, just have to get over COVID, I guess. Anybody else have a question or comment? Oh, no, Professor. Thank you. Okay, sure. Professor, good night. Good night. <laughs> good night. Good night, Professor. Yeah, okay. I think I'm going to do that email thing first. So it'll probably be one o'clock before I get to bed, but that's all right. I don't have to get up. So do you have other professors that are teaching in the middle of the night? Because they're living in places. Curious about that. Okay, I'm gonna close the meeting down if no one has anything else. Oh, okay, Isabel. Sure, Isabel, what would you like to talk about? So, Nashiba, do you have something you want to ask me? Uh, no, Professor, so I'll just leave. Okay, so Masoma, do you have something? Uh, no, Professor, thank okay. you. Okay, I mean, I, I don't know if Isabel, you know, wants to wait until everybody else is gone or what, what the story is, that's all. Uh, uh yeah, Professor, so basically uh, the host was ending the meeting, so I thought that we have something to say. So, okay, okay. goodbye, Professor. Okay, Good night. goodbye. Good night. Okay, Isabel, do you have a question or? Oh, okay, so you're just going to type in the chat, that's fine. I'll just open up the chat. Um, there, go ahead and type and I'll just. Okay, so Isabel, I will, I'm going to send a whole email with all the names of everybody. Professor? Yeah. Can you hear me? Ah, that's good. Thank you. So, are you on the, did I invite you to the Google Classroom? No, Professor. Professor, actually, I want to ask uh, you a question uh, regarding this course, because I am just, uh, Rising use it too, and I'm still actually confused about the course itself. So, also this time I only get one courses. So I'm I am 
fine to join your courses to get the course to, so I can get two courses. However, I'm still actually confused about. I know that this this course is for uh, soccer and uh, minor psychology, right? So my question is, as I have not decided about my minor, but I am planning to decide to take uh, psychology as my minor, but I'm actually still confused about how I can, what are the requirements and all. If you have any idea, would you like to share it to me? Okay, I'm not quite Regarding sure. taking the minor and about the course as well. Okay, so I'm not quite sure if you said, I, you have a question about the psychology minor? Yes, yes. Okay, so um, actually, yeah, go ahead. Well, actually, I one of my worst things has always been being an advisor because I can never remember, I can never remember all the details about the um, what the students do. So I'm only teaching one semester a year, and I don't have any advisees. So I'm not I'm not the person to ask. Um, but you do have an advisor, I assume. Yeah, I actually I have a advisor, but they keep changing the advisor. Like not I guess not until one more, and it changes again and again. I don't I don't know. Now I I get another new new advisor as well. And, yeah, I okay, find so you could go to, I mean, I think I don't want to make her busier than she is, except that you could just email Dr. Cohn and just say you keep getting your advisor changed and you would really like to have a more stable advisor because you need advice about the psychology major or if you're thinking of PPE, I'm not sure. What's your, um, you know, Considering majoring or minoring in PPE, and you'd rather have an advisor in PPE, or if you, if your main subject is one of the other divisions, so you need an advisor in that division, right? Is that part of the issue? Yes, 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 professor. Actually, my my major is uh, public health, so it is a science major. So it's not a required courses that I have to take, but it's a core courses as well. But I have finished my four courses so far. So I'm just thinking to take it because I am planning to take uh, psychology as my minor. So yeah, because this is one of the requirement for the minor in psychology as well. I thought you have any idea about this. So I'm kind of like a little bit confused about the minor and all. So I'm thinking that if you have any idea that you could share and like well actually i've never taught this before at auw and is that a requirement of the minor is it for elective of the minor sorry is it a requirement of the psychology minor this class or is it just an elective yes 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 it is what? it is uh um requirement for the minor in psychology really wow uh because i just uh dr yeah. and i just decided that i would teach it i don't know a month or two ago so making it a requirement um well i mean i uh, my thing is philosophy right so focus on ideas mm -hmm. and the power of ideas but the course will show you how most psychology class and most people in psychology assume the empiricist point of view, blank slate point of view. And so I have a more philosophical take on it, right? So I, I only teach that as one possible, mm -hmm. and I teach that it's strengths and weaknesses. Uh, then, as a matter of fact, there's at least one very prominent neuroscientist 
who has rejected the enlightenment views of the psyche. And he has his own view of psyche. So that's at the end of the semester. So that's what this course is about. It's about contextualizing the academic discipline of psychology. Okay, okay. And the other thing is that you do a research paper on some type of psychology or psychological therapy, methodology, the way that psychology is practiced in the world. So some aspect of psychology, you do a research paper on that to find out what's going on there in the, in the real world. Um, so if you, are you thinking of being a professional psychologist or you just, oh, that's right, you're doing public health. So um, of course there's a psychology related to, to public health. Um, when you go into wherever you go to provide public health, you have to you know, deal with people psychologically, right? Their fears and their hopes. And um, for example, the letter today, the notion that um, strength of mind, right? So there's gonna be some kind of variation of talking to your patients um, in some way that can help them cope with their illness or maintain their health or something. So I think that you can use it. Um, you know, it's hard for me to gauge it because um, the way I do things is really different from the current trends, but Dr. Cohn thinks that's fine, right? <laughs> because she also is um, outside of the norm, but, um, you know, that's about all I can say is that it gives you some perspective about what all the alternatives are about theories of the human psyche and what a healthy psyche is and how it thinks and how it feels. Um, so today, for example, you're supposed to train your emotions. You're not supposed to just describe them. <laughs> they aren't, you know, they, they are accountable. You're accountable for your emotions. Um, and you should uh, train yourself in how to feel without repressing your emotions, don't repress them, but without just giving in to anything. So that, that's the kind of thing that I do in my class. Yeah, actually I'm really interested in taking your uh, courses, just because I'm still a little bit confused about minor techniques and all. Also the requirements, the requirements, yes, I know it is, one of the requirements. So I'm 